Okay, so we're going to get started with uh, the intro material for hematology. Here's our little blood smear with lots of interesting white blood cells ready to be identified. All right, so we're going to study um, hematology, which is specifically the study of blood. And this is going to cover morphology, physiology, and pathology. Morphology is the study of form and structure. Um, so you can kind of think of it as sort of the anatomy of the cells that we're going to be studying. Physiology is the study of function. So what do these cells do and why do they do it in the way that they do it? And then finally, pathology, which is the study of changes or abnormalities within the cell. Um, and within these particular types of cells that we're going to study. So that's kind of the structure of the semester for us. So let's start out with reasons why we examine blood at all. And probably the, the main reason that we do it is to kind of check and see if our patients are doing okay. Um, screening procedures for general health are really, really important, especially as our patients age. Um, there are changes that are, are expected with age, but there are a lot of things that happen with disease states that if we are checking our patients before they get sick or before they show clinical signs of illness, we can really do a lot um, to kind of get out in front of the disease and hopefully slow it down or even, even stop or cure it. Um, so that's one reason why we might examine blood. Another is to assess the body's ability to fight infection, and in particular, hematology looks at this. Our white blood cell counts. Um, are they too high? Are they too low? Are there certain cells that are in excess or depleted? And what that means for a patient's ability to fight the infection that we are concerned they may have. An adjunct or an assist to evaluate our, our diagnosis or the evaluation of our patient. Um, a lot of times, hematology is the tool that we use to obtain a diagnosis. Um, more often than not, it's, it's helping out in the whole picture, uh, but there are some conditions that we can diagnose just by looking at a blood smear. Um, Immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, for instance, is, is a diagnosis via blood smear for most of our patients. Um, so that's something that's really important in the examination of blood. And then finally, to evaluate the progress of a disease condition. So how is this patient doing with the disease that we have diagnosed or that we have identified within it? And we'll, we'll use the uh, you know, evaluations of blood smears or of blood in general to evaluate how that patient is doing as, uh, as they improve or, or worsen. So let's talk about the three main functions of blood. Um, function number one, and I think the one we think of probably the most often is transportation. Uh, transportation of nutrients, transportation of oxygen, transportation of waste products. So that's what we're gonna focus on first. Um, the first one is the transportation of, um, as relates to the respiratory system. So in particular, carrying oxygen to the tissues from the lungs, and then carrying carbon dioxide from the tissues to the lungs and then out of the body. And so getting rid of carbon dioxide as a waste product and moving oxygen into the body and then to the cells so that um, that oxygen can be used in the production of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, for cellular energy. Another transportation um, function is the nutritive or nutrient function. So food, primarily glucose, needs to be taken to all of the cells and the tissues formed by the cells. And, um, uh, you know, so the nutrient of glucose and the nutrient of oxygen needs to be taken to all of these uh, cells throughout the body. Um, we can carry nutrients from the intestines to other parts of the body as well, different um, proteins, electrolytes, fats, carbohydrates that are broken down and, and digested and then absorbed by the intestines. And then we can also take nutrients from the liver and distribute to other parts of the body as well. 
especially vitamins and uh, different proteins that are produced by the liver. We also need that transport of blood to get rid of waste products or elimination. So we have um, the uh, elimination of uh, waste products from the kidneys in the form of urine um, that is, uh, occurs when there's filtration of the blood through the nephrons um, and production of urine that way. Then we have um, production of fecal matter at the intestines, um, perspiration coming from the skin, um, and in our patients, generally coming from the oral cavity or the foot pads. And then finally, um, elimination of uh, breakdown products from the liver. Uh, these are waste products made from the breakdown of carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and red blood cells. Then we also have the transportation of hormones. Now remember, our endocrine system is a system of, of uh, organs that uh, releases hormones directly into the bloodstream, and the blood is responsible for carrying those hormones to all the different parts of the body, whether it's a target organ or it's a releasing organ, hormone going to another endocrine organ. Um, the bloodstream is what carries all those hormones where they need to go. So we're talking pituitary, thyroid hormone, growth hormone, um, sex hormones like testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone as well. Um, so hormones are uh, transported through the blood. All right, so if function number one is transportation, function number two is basically maintaining homeostasis or regulation. And this is helping to keep our tissue fluids all at the right concentration. Homeostasis in the blood is generally dealing with um, keeping the plasma levels in the tissues and the vessels, the blood vessels, kind of at an equilibrium or an equal measure. Um, this is when we have a normal red blood cell count or a packed cell volume and normal total protein levels we will, should have um, good plasma concentrations of uh, fluid within the um, uh, plasma and in the tissues and the blood vessels as well. Uh, in a patient that is dehydrated, we can expect our plasma level um, in the tissues and vessels will decrease, so the fluid will decrease, and that will then uh, result in an elevation in pack cell volume and total protein. So total protein and red blood cell count or pack cell volume will appear elevated in a dehydrated patient. In a patient that, that's overhydrated, we can see increased plasma or increased fluid in the vessels and in the tissues. Therefore, that will decrease, cause a false lowering of the pack cell volume and the total protein. And so you'll see a lower PCV in total protein um, in an overhydrated patient as compared to a normal patient. We're also gonna get regulation of body temperature. So not just regulation of fluid, we're gonna get regulation of body temperature as well. There are receptors um, in the brain, the hypothalamus primarily, that are telling the body if it's too warm or too cold. Um, and this is determined by the temperature of the blood that's reaching that portion of the brain. Um, the blood vessels are gonna dilate and constrict to reserve or conserve, to release or conserve heat. And so if a patient is too warm, this will be, um, Basically, alerted, the brain will be alerted by this warm blood coming to um, the hypothalamus and being detected there by the receptors. That will send out signals to the rest of the body for blood vessels to dilate, thus releasing heat into the atmosphere, um, into the surrounding area, and that will help to uh, maintain um, homeostatic blood temperature or body temperature for those patients. Another regulation function of uh, the blood is to maintain the pH or the acid-base balance, um, another homeostatic mechanism. So normal pH for a patient, uh, for the mammals that we, we treat, is going to be 7.35 to 7.45. So it's a really narrow range. And if the pH gets too basic or too low or too, um, excuse me, if the patient gets too 
um, basic or too high or too acidic or too low of the pH, this can actually be fatal to our patient. Um, we generally, this normal or uh, neutral, excuse me, pH is right at 7.0. So mammal bodies are generally slightly more basic or alkaline, um, and this is going to balance out our acidotic metabolic wastes. But we can get too much acid building up. That is going to be um, difficult for our body to maintain that homeostasis. And this is where we get the change in the pH balance in the blood in order to try and maintain that. Um, disease states like vomiting, diarrhea, fever, all of these can affect the pH of the blood, and that's going to cause changes within the blood to help maintain that acid-base balance. And then we come to uh, reason number three, or function number three for blood, and that's our defensive function. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this this for this semester because that's a lot of what hematology is about is the white blood cell population. Um, so white blood cells are our body's defense mechanism um, and these are naturally going to protect against disease. We constantly have different types of white blood cells circulating all the time. Neutrophils, be uh, basophils, eosinophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, they're constantly circulating in order to identify and then attack any foreign invaders like bacteria, viruses, and fungal elements. Um, we also have the defense of platelets and other clotting factors to respond to any kind of blood vessel damage, any kind of endothelial damage. We'll uh, start that coagulation cascade that we'll talk about towards the end of the semester. So here are our blood components. Um, this image here is unfortunately showing a gross human, so I apologize about that, but it was a nice picture showing the different uh, elements within the blood. So we've got, um, once we take a blood sample and then centrifuge it, we're gonna see those, those portions of the blood separate out, um, mostly based on the weight of the, um, the elements. And so the bottom, you know, roughly 45% of blood volume is gonna be uh, the erythrocytes, so the red blood cells. Um, and so about 45% of the, um, the mammal bloodstream is taken up by red blood cells. Then we've got this buffy coat, this little white layer in the middle, and that's going to contain all of our white blood cells and platelets in that area. And then finally, the last 55% of our blood is going to be made, um, made up of plasma, which is primarily liquid or water with some dissolved solutes in there. As well. So let's talk about the cellular portion um, of our bloodstream first. So we've got the white blood cells, and you know, as you know, white blood cells, that's our main um, immune defense system. Um, they make up a much smaller portion of the bloodstream than do our red blood cells, um, but they are extremely important in um, kind of protecting the body. Um, then we've got our red blood cells, again, making up about 45% of the total blood volume. And then finally, platelets. They make up less than 1%, but they are quite important because um, they're the, the first portion of the clotting mechanism is triggered by platelets. Um, when we look at white, red, and uh, platelet cells all together, that's called whole blood. Now the liquid portion, this is um, our plasma. This is again about 55% of the blood volume. Um, this is composed of about 90% water. And then about 10% that is dissolved solids. So let's talk about those dissolved solids a little bit. Um, those are nutrients, um, metabolic wastes, uh, things like urea, nitrogen, and creatinine, um, which are waste products um, removed by the kidneys. Um, we've got hormones, antibodies, and other types of proteins that are all circulating through the plasma and being carried by this liquid water. Um, and uh, so that's, that's about 10% of that liquid portion. Um, here's another diagram. This is best looked at uh, at your leisure um, as, as you look through the PowerPoint, but it kind of breaks everything down even more specifically into the cellular elements, um, our red blood cells, our white blood cells, and platelets on the right, and then on the left, the plasma. Um, and it shows like the electrolytes um, or the different salts that are being carried around, sodium, potassium, calcium, 
magnesium chloride, bicarbonate, our plasma proteins, albumin, that's one that you'll hear about a lot, especially when we're looking at chemistry panels, and then all the other nutrients that are um, in the blood, like glucose, fatty acid, vitamins, waste products, um, you know, liver enzymes, um, respiratory gases, hormones, all those things are going to be in the plasma.